All right. YouTube is live. Let's see, make sure it's working. Twitch is working. Let's check on the tube. YouTube is working and let's check on X. Figured out that you can actually get uh, Twitter or X to start early as long as you hit start. Never mind. You cannot do that. All right. Well, we will just wait. Until that, welcome Josh. How's it going? How's it going, John? How's it going, Majetti Gizzle? How's it going, Ed? How's it going, you, June? Hope you guys are ready. This one's pretty crazy. I'm going to leave it on this screen for a second here, at least while it turns 8 a.m. Eugene with a question. I find a way to read papers, math formula, and explain. I noticed that you skip math formula, explain, and Bayesian flow. I hope this was, this can cut off your research time. I don't know what you mean, man. I'm sorry, Eugene here. Yeah, the Bayesian flow network paper was like 40 pages long, so I skipped a bunch of that, but I don't know, maybe I need to have six hour streams where I go over entire papers. Thanks for the uh, congratulations, Ed. 5K subs is uh, big, made it to the big leagues. All right, I think it's officially started. Welcome to another Hoopo stream and we're going to announce it. Today we're going to be reading a Google DeepMind paper that kind of exploded in popularity recently. I kind of see it popping up everywhere. And this is called a Large Language Models as Optimizers. So large language models are your LLMs and optimization is kind of a very high level generic word used to describe a process by which you improve something. Uh, but of course optimization has more specific narrow definitions depending on uh, which branch of math, I guess, and which branch of science you are in. Um, what else? 7 September 2023, so relatively recent work here. Uh, got some pretty hardcore people here from Google DeepMind, uh, and let's dump into it. Optimization is ubiquitous. All right, starting off strong. This is kind of a meaningless sentence. While derivative-based algorithms have powerful tools for various purposes, the absence of a gradient in imposes challenges on many real world applications. Okay, so what are they talking about here? What they're talking about here is that optimization, most of the time you're doing optimization specifically in the machine learning context, you're doing some variant of basically this, call it gradient descent, but you're calculating the derivative or the gradient or the slope, all of those words basically mean the same thing and then moving in that direction. So you're basically saying, hey, if I change the value of my little weight, let's say this W axis here corresponds to the value of a single individual parameter, a single individual little neuron in your neural net, right? Uh, neural nets now have billions of parameters. So just imagine that we're talking about billion parameter spaces here, but you're just saying, okay, well, if I change this little parameter uh, by a little bit, how does that change, for example, my loss function here? My DJ might be the, the loss function is what I want to improve here. And then you'd say, okay, well, actually, it seems to be a little bit lower that way than this way. Therefore, I'm going to take a step that way. And that's one step, right? So most optimization processes that we have now and optimization algorithms depend on this ability to calculate the slope or put in a more fancy way, uh, you need to find the gradient. So if you have seen any of our other streams, right, we constantly are reading uh, computer vision papers, for example, where every single part of the computer vision pipeline needs to be 
differentiable, which basically is a fancy way of saying we need to be able to find the slope through this. We need to be able to, be able to do the, the, the back propagation through this, right? The chain rule through that. So that's kind of a huge problem for if you want to apply optimization to something that you can't find this slope, right? And what they're going to figure out in this paper is that LLMs can do that. LLMs can basically optimize for you without necessarily having to have any notion of explicitly calculating the slope. Uh, in this work, we propose optimization by prompting OPRO. I don't know why they came up with this absolute dog shit name here. Optimization by prompting OPRO. I don't know if OPRO means something in some other language or something, but that's just kind of a weird name. <laughs> A simple and effective approach to leverage large language models as optimizers where the optimization task is described in natural language. Okay, so it's going to be very hard to find the slope of something and the derivative of something if that something is all in natural language, right? So in each optimization step, the LLM generates new solutions from the prompt that contains previously generated solutions with their values. Okay, so it's kind of doing this in-context kind of iterative optimization process, right? You're saying, here's the previous solution, can you give me the next solution? Here's the next solution, can you give me the, and so on, right? Any optimization process is kind of a multi-step process, right? When you're training a neural network, uh, each step is part of that training process, sometimes called an iteration. Usually it's a whole batch of things that you're feeding in at the same time, but we're talking millions and millions and billions of training steps. Uh, when you train a neural network. And the reason you need to take these millions and millions of, of training steps is because uh, when you're optimizing a neural network, the loss landscape is very complicated. Here's, for example, a two-dimensional uh, loss landscape. So whereas here you have a single parameter, right? And you're saying, what's the derivative of my loss with respect to this single parameter? And there's a very obvious kind of minima there. Here is, uh, let's say you had two different uh, parameters. You had little two parameter uh, neural network. This might be what your loss landscape looks like. And now it's quite complicated, right? You have to be constantly calculating the derivative kind of at every single point and then slowly meandering your way down and finding this uh, little local minima here. But that's part of the problem, right? Is that you don't even actually know if this is the global minima. For all you know, this is just a very shallow hole. And then there's a huge deep hole down here where your loss would be way lower if only you would end up in this part. So gradients are hard. We first showcase OPRO on linear regression and then the traveling salesman problem. So these are kind of very simple, you know. This is a paper that is more trying to explain and show something cool and it's not necessarily trying to beat any awesome, cool uh, benchmarks, right? Linear regression is possibly the most simple form of optimization. So in linear regression, you have a bunch of points like this and you're trying to fit a line. So the equation of a line like this uh, largely has two parameters in it. It has the slope, so y equals mx plus b, right? And then it has this uh, point here at which it crosses this y-axis. So as you're optimizing the line that best fits this set of points, you're basically changing the slope of that line, which is that m parameter and that y equals mx plus b, and then you're changing at which point it intersects this y-axis, and you can optimize the values of those little individual of those two parameters and eventually get a line that fits nicely. Uh, and then the traveling salesman problem, this is the Wikipedia page for the traveling salesman problem, but it's basically you have a bunch of points that are separated by some distance, and you have to decide what is the order at which you traverse these points that minimizes the distance. So here is, for example, a brute force uh, solution to this uh, traveling salesman problem. So you can see how like the distance goes up and down. You're just basically trying every single possible connection between all these different things and get that optimal distance. So not necessarily the uh, most amazing problems to show uh, that your OPRO optimization technique is is Amazing, but, you know, they're very easy to understand. Uh, okay. Uh, then move on to prompt optimization, where the goal is to find instructions that maximize task accuracy. Okay, so this is the kind of more interesting uh, thing that comes out of this paper, where they're going to basically use the language model to optimize the prompt. So 
All that prompt engineering that people have been doing where they're manually typing in prompts and then seeing which one does better, it turns out you can do that same exact thing with language models and kind of cutting to the, to the chase here. The TLDR for this paper is basically these prompts. It's these prompts that have been optimized by LLMs that are optimal for uh, whatever you want, right? Uh, so everybody knows this one, right? This was one that came out a while ago now where basically if you asked ChatGPT something or any of these language models that are instruction tuned so that they're kind of in this chatbot format, and at the very end you said, let's think step by step, it would actually increase <laughs> the uh, quality of the response. So they took this a step further and said, okay, can we use LLMs as an optimizer in this natural language space and then figure out what the best possible additional prompt or kind of like extra little thing that you put at the end there to get the best possible answer. And you can see here how simply adding the words, take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step increases your accuracy on, this is a, uh, we're gonna go into these benchmarks here, but they're basically like these little uh, thought problems, little word problems. It gives you a 10% improvement in accuracy, which is kind of weird and, and mind bending to realize that prompt engineering has that level of impact, but it does. Uh, with a variety of LLMs, we demonstrate that the best prompts optimized by Opro outperform human design prompts. All right, so all your prompt engineers, uh, they're gonna be thrown out of work. They don't have a job anymore by up to 8% on GSM-8K and uh, Big Bench Hard Tasks. Okay, so what the what what is GSM-8K? What is Big Bench Hard? So GSM-8K, uh, and by the way, I know most of you probably already know this, but if you want any of the links that I'm going to show here, I have a GitHub page called Stream Docs, and this has all the different links to all the different uh, stuff that I'm showing here. So GSM-8K is a data set of 8.5 high quality, linguistically diverse grade school math word problems. Okay, so it's these kind of like classic, uh, Beth bakes four comma two dozen batches of cookies. If these cookies are shared, how many cookies does each person consume and so on. And the final answer is six. So here when they're showing you that uh, the training accuracy on GSM-8K is improving over time, what that means is that they keep asking uh, a language model, in this case Palm 2. Palm 2 is Google's kind of language model, kind of the equivalent of GPT-4. Uh, but you see here the Palm 2 LIT, like what do these extra words here, or things here mean? So Palm 2, this refers to the fact that it's the second version of Palm. So there was a Palm 1, now there's a Palm 2. The L refers to the fact that it's a large version, so Palm comes in a variety of different sizes, much like, uh, for example, Llama. You have Llama 7B, Llama 13B, Llama 70B, right? That's the number of parameters, so Palm 2L is the large version of Palm. And then IT means uh, instruction tuned. So this is when you take a language model that normally is just a giant kind of alien type of intelligence that it just predicts the probability of the next word, right? It just says, what is the next word given this set of words? But these IT are instruction tuned, which means you've turned it into this kind of chat bot that goes back and forth and creates this kind of conversation for you. There's a lot of different ways to turn a raw language model into this instruction tune. You can have RLHF, you can fine tune it and so on, but, uh, Anytime you see that IT, just think it's kind of like a chat bot. So if you were to ask this same question here, Beth Bakes, blah, 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 and then here you added, uh, let's think step by step, it would improve the accuracy of this answer. And if you added, take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step, which kind of feels like it's the exact same thing, kind of doesn't make any sense why it would actually improve, but it does. That's, that's kind of how it works. You add that extra little crap there, and then you get a better answer. 80% accuracy rather than 71% accuracy compared to an empty string. So if you don't add anything, 34% accuracy. That's weird. That's very weird, right? It's kind of, it's almost like psychology, right? You're getting to the point of uh, people who study like sports psychology who are sitting there and they're like, hey, as a coach, like what, what kind of words should I tell my athletes so that they perform best? And there's like kind of a whole science around that of like, you got to be encouraging, but then also give them negative feedback and occasionally do that. That's starting to exist for language models, right? The fact that you can ask these kind of questions like this, which seem like you should just get the same answer every time, but 
the fact that if you give it nothing, 34% accuracy, if you give it let's think step by step, 71% accuracy, and then take a deep breath, 80% accuracy. So we're, we're almost talking about psychology for LLMs at this point. All right, so that's GSM 8K. And then uh, BBH is kind of the same thing. So BBH stands for Big Bench Hard. So Big Bench Hard is a benchmark created by Google. So this is uh, the GitHub page for that benchmark. Uh, they call it BIG stands for Beyond the Imitation Game. Obviously, they kind of picked it because it has the word big and everybody likes the word big. You know, that's a great name. But the imitation game refers to a uh, the original Turing test. So Turing was one of the original kind of computer scientist people. I think we actually read his paper somewhere on our YouTube channel. You guys are welcome to dig up that old stream. But Turing's definition of basically when we've achieved AGI is whenever you can basically put a computer behind a screen from a human and the human can't tell that it's a computer, right? So it's imitating a human, right? If you're sitting there having a conversation with what you think is a human and you can't tell if this is a human or if it's a computer. And that was Turing's definition of once we've kind of reached this this singularity inflection point, right? Once computers can perfectly imitate humans, then we've done it. So people have kind of changed that benchmark. Obviously, we've reached that, right? ChatGPT kind of does reach that. For most people, it would imitate humans quite well. So this benchmark is going beyond that, right? They're saying, okay, well, now that we've been in the imitation game benchmark, let's go beyond that. And they created this uh, beyond the imitation game benchmark, which has about 200 different tasks. You can actually click here and it's all the different tasks. And they're kind of weird things here. You got everything from solve tasks, from abstract reasoning, perform basic arithmetic operations, identify the word displayed as ASCII art. Uh, you can even go here, ASCII art recognition. So what is this? This is Big Bench, right? You can see I don't know, kind of weird set of things. I can't even read this one. Bench. Bench. Look at that. Okay, so that's BBH, and you have kind of a, a long tail of weird benchmarks here. And I think you can actually submit to this. I'm not exactly sure how you do it, but you can uh, submit your own benchmarks to this, and then eventually they will be included. So kind of similar to how OpenAI tries to get people to submit test and eval or benchmarks, Google does the same thing. They want you to submit benchmarks that make... Uh, it's easier for them to evaluate uh, these language models. Correctly close a dick end word. Guess popular movies from their emoji descriptions. There's a lot of weird shit in here. Name geometric shapes from their SVG paths. Uh, question by Yu June. YouTube channel deleted my GPT-4 conversation website by sharing it. I'll send you a message on Discord. Okay, you do that. Uh, what do we got here? Prompt optimization. Optimization has pre-trained Palm to L as the score, and then the instruction tune Palm to L as the optimizer. So, kind of what they're referring to here is that uh, in this optimization, for example, here, right, we have the the y-axis. You could think of it like the loss function or the score, and then the W is the variable that you're actually trying to optimize. For example, it could be the weight inside a neuron of a neural net, right? One parameter. So you're going to need a score and then the actual thing that you're trying to optimize. So in this case, the score is going to come from another language model. And this is something that we see over and over again now, where basically you're using a language model to score and evaluate other language models. So the language models are grading the other language models. Uh, BBH movie recommendation has text bison. So bison is one of the sizes of palm. I think palm bison. Let's see if we can find the image. They had a nice picture of this. Yeah, here we go. So the palm two uh, models are, of course, there's different sizes, and then they came up with cool little names for the different sizes. So gecko is the very tiny version of palm two, then otter, then bison, then unicorn. I wonder how long it took them to pick these animals. Uh, they probably try to explicitly pick animals that are not scary, you know? I wonder if a guy recommended, hey, why don't we do lion? And they're like, nah, dude, lion's a little bit too aggressive. We can't have lions. God, how about unicorn, right? 
Okay, so that's what they did. I don't get it. How can we make sure the other language model is not giving us wrong scores? <laughs> I think you're asking the good questions, Ali, but we don't know the question. We don't know the answer to that. <laughs> It's just kind of the way it is. It just works, you know. Why, why does this increase accuracy? Nobody knows. Anybody who tells you that they know exactly why this increases accuracy is bullshitting you. These things are very much black boxes, and this paper just kind of goes to show you that they're even more black boxes than we thought they were. And yeah, it's still. I still think it's weird that we're using language models to evaluate the output of other language models. You ask it nicely to tell the truth. <laughs> uh, okay, so here they're starting to reference a couple different optimization papers, right? The whole point, the the kind of, not the whole point, but generally pretty much every single optimization algorithm has some kind of iterative update to optimize the objective function. So the objective function could be your loss function. It could be the uh, how good this prompt is at, getting the right answer on this GSM8K benchmark, which is what they're going to be doing here. The optimization algorithm typically needs to be customized for an individual task, right? And this is true. There's a lot of different types of optimization algorithms. Everybody knows uh, the optimizers that you use for deep learning now, but there's a very long and historic literature on optimization problems all the way back to people like Newton, right? Who came up with the original Newton method. Newton's method, which is basically the same thing. It's kind of a gradient-based optimization method, right? So people have been doing this for a long time. The earliest paper they got here is a 1993 paper, but we're talking like probably BC, right? I'm sure there was Sumerian people who had some variant of a gradient-based optimization process. Uh, we propose optimization by prompting, simple and effective approach. With the advancements of prompting techniques, LLMs have achieved impressive performance. So here's a little paragraph about how they're talking about LLMs being awesome. Their ability to understand natural language lays out a new possibility. Instead of formally defining the optimization problem and deriving the update step with a program solver, which is kind of what we do now, right? We describe the optimization problem in natural language that instruct the LLM to iteratively generate new solutions based on the problem description and the previously found solutions. So now the LLM is just doing all of it. And this kind of goes in line with the LLMs are general pattern machines. This is another paper that we read on the channel where uh, a group from also Google, in this case kind of more robotics flavored research group, but they basically realized that these language models, they're way beyond language models. They can do everything. They like you give them any kind of generic pattern and they can complete it, right? So here you have LLMs kind of solving weird uh, kind of like puzzles, visual puzzles, LLMs fitting uh, lines to dots, LLMs uh, balancing cart poles, LLMs being used for robots. So these language models, they're extremely good uh, at finding patterns and then extrapolating from those patterns, right? They're general pattern machines and optimization is kind of like that right in optimization you're kind of you're saying okay what is the pattern here in this local area and can I basically extrapolate and make a good guess as to where I would need to travel uh, to end up in a better place according to my optimization objective right so optimization is kind of like a type of pattern matching which is kind of why language models can even do this. Uh, LLM with, or optimization with LLMs enables quick adaptation to different tasks by changing the problem description in the prompt and the optimization, prop, optimization process can be customized by adding instructions to specify the desired properties of solutions, adding instructions. So I think for most of this paper, what they're largely gonna be doing is taking these little questions and then figuring out what is the, the extra crab, the extra little tokens that I need to add to the end of this in order to improve this final answer here, right? So all they're trying to figure out, the optimization process is what extra text sentence can I add to the end of that to improve the performance? Uh, to demonstrate the potential, there can show some uh, results on linear regression and the traveling salesman, which are two classic optimization problems. 
Uh, on small scale optimization problems, we show that LLMs are able to find good quality solutions simply through prompting and sometimes match or surpass hand designed heuristic algorithms. Yeah. Sometimes match or surpass eventually becomes always match or surpass. Match or surpass. Uh, we demonstrate the ability of LLMs to optimize prompts. The optimization goal is to find a prompt that maximizes the task accuracy or minimizes the loss, right? Depends on which way you want to think about it. You're either maximizing the negative loss or maximizing the reward or minimizing the negative reward or maximizing the accuracy. Like the maximize, minimize doesn't matter. It just depends on what the sign is on your uh, score. Specifically, we focus on natural language processing, where the both task input and task output are in text formats. LMs are sensitive to the prompt format. Semantically similar prompts may have drastically different performance. That sentence there, I just thought that was huge because we kind of already all understand this, but I don't feel like a lot of people get the kind of gravitas behind that of just how weird that is, that <laughs> changing a couple words in a prompt has a huge impact on the final behavior and performance of the of the language model, right? The fact that prompt engineering is a thing, it just goes to show you how much of a black box these things still are. Optimal prompt formats can be model specific and task specific. And this is maybe one of the negative parts of this paper is that these optimal prompts are not generic. So it's not like you can take this uh, prompt addition thing here take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step and it'll work every single time. It's only going to work within this specific GSM 8K benchmark. And then they actually go on later, so way down at the bottom of the paper, they give you the the best uh, prompt additions for each of the different tasks in uh, BBH. So if you remember, BBH is a bunch of different benchmarks, right? So for example, uh, here we go, answer questions in Hindi or answer questions about Hindu mythology. So the the extra little piece of prompt that you're going to add to Hindu knowledge questions is probably going to be different uh, for than the extra little piece of prompt that you're going to add for identify an object using the ASCII art, right? And what's weird is that some of these look very strange, right? So for example, uh, Boolean expression. So there's some part of the BBH task where you have to basically solve these little Boolean expressions, and it turns out that the instruction that you need to add in order to improve the accuracy optimally is group sub-expressions with parentheses to accurately evaluate logical expressions, determine the resulting is either true or false. Okay, that one kind of seems fine. How about this one? Snarks. So, I don't know what the snark... Uh, let's actually see, maybe, maybe we can get an idea of what that is. Snark. Here we go, snarks. Determine which of the two sentences is sarcastic. So this is what the snark benchmark is, is basically, I guess, you have to pick which of two sentences is the most sarcastic. College is happening, forgetting assignments, but that could never happen in reality, where software never malfunctions. So obviously, this is sarcastic. But when you ask the LLM to give you the most sarcastic answer, it turns out that the most optimal thing to prompt or prompt engineer at the end of that is say, choose the option that wickedly embodies a sarcasm. Why the word wickedly? Why the word embodies? Nobody really knows. <laughs> so these are pretty cool. Like this is, I think, the coolest part of the paper. It's at, all the way at the very bottom in the appendices section. They basically go through all the different BBH and you can just see the weird shit. So for example, in dick languages, I don't know much about this. I don't know what this is. Dick languages. I think these are basically the, the type of problems where you have to like close the parentheses or something like that because it, if you actually look here, the extra prompt engineer is add the missing closed parentheses. So there you go. That'll improve your accuracy on that. Okay, let's go back to the paper, but if you guys don't have a lot of time, I would just go down to that bottom uh, in the appendices and look at that because that's kind of the TLDR for the entire paper. Uh, okay, prompt engineering is often important for LLMs to achieve good performance. However, the large and discrete prompt space makes it challenging for optimization. So large and discrete, what they're referring to here is that it's uh, a very large prompt space, right? All possible uh, sentences is a huge space to explore. 
but it's also discrete, right? There is only 26 English letters or 27, I don't exactly know. And there's a limited set of tokens, right? Any language model is uh, predicting the probability of the next token, and there's a limited vocabulary of those tokens. So even though it's a ginormous space, it's it's still discrete and it's defined. It's not infinite, and there's discrete values for every single possible sentence that you could have. So it's not continuous. Uh, and this makes it challenging for optimization. Why is it challenging for optimization? Because if it's discrete, you can't take the derivative, right? You can only take the derivative of something that is continuous like that, right? If this thing was a little step function, you, how you can get the direction of that hill, right? You're not. So a discretized space, uh, you can't uh, optimize that with a gradient-based method, especially when only API access to the LLM is available. Here's a little dig on GPT-4 here. They're basically saying, hey, you guys aren't releasing all your shit, but you know that also applies to Google. They're not releasing all their stuff either, so I don't know why they're uh, kind of hitting OpenAI on that. Following prior work on discrete prompt optimization, we assume the training set is available to compute the training accuracy as the objective value for optimization, and we show in experiments that optimizing the prompt accuracy on a small training set is sufficient to reach high performance on the test set. So, when you're training a neural net, right, kind of the assumption that you're making is that if I optimize the weights of this neural net for my training data set, my neural net will be better on my test data set, right? And there's a lot of different parts in that that are assumptions, right? There's an assumption that your training data set and your test data set are kind of the same. They're representing the same data, data distribution, right? But then there's also the uh, assumption that, okay, your training set is even big enough to actually give you an accurate uh, representation of that data set distribution. So there's a lot of different assumptions that go into even just the basic uh, concept of training a neural net with a training data set and evaluating on a test data set. Here they're not talking about optimizing a neural net here. What they're talking about is optimizing the prompt, right? So choosing the right sequence of tokens to add to the very end of one of these questions in order to reach a high performance on a, I guess, a holdout set of these same types of questions. Uh, and there's only 8,000 problems in this GSM 8K, so I guess they probably split this into the 7.5K training and 1K test. Uh, the prompt the LLM serves as a call to the optimizer, and we name it the Metaprompt. Okay, shows an example, figure three. We're going to get to that. The Metaprompt contains two core pieces. The first piece is a previously generated prompts with their corresponding training accuracies, and then the second piece is the optimization problem description, which includes several exemplars randomly selected from the training set to exemplify the task of interest. So kind of this same type of idea of like in context where you're you're not fine-tuning the neural net. You're not changing anything in the language model in terms of like the actual language model parameters. What you're doing is you're basically adding extra context, adding extra prompt, which then changes uh, the probability of tokens that come out the other end of the LLM. Holy crap, you guys are blowing up the chat here. Who watches the Watchmen? Nobody does. The Watchmen do. Uh, I'm guessing we will start seeing general optimizers that figure out how to best query whatever... Uh, model is being used. I kind of agree with that. I stably solve the problem using instruction custom. Always forgets to delete that. Yeah, language models are not deterministic. They don't always output the same thing given the same input. Uh, different from recent work on using LLMs for automatic prompt generation, each optimization step in our work generates new prompts that aim to increase the test accuracy based on the trajectory of previous generated prompts. I don't know, I don't like this word trajectory here. Trajectory, I feel like it's better used kind of in 3D space. You know, it's an actual continuous uh, kind of line that traces out a position in 3D space. I don't know about trajectory in sentence space. That seems like a little bit of a stretch, but okay. Instead of editing one input prompt according to natural language feedback or requiring a new prompt to follow the same semantic meaning, making use of the full optimization trajectory, OPRO enables the LLM to gradually generate new prompts that enable the task accuracy through the optimization process. Okay, so what does that actually look like? Let's look at figure three, where they show us a meta prompt. Where is figure three? Did they bury this all the way down here? Yeah, they did. Look at that. Figure three 
It's like four pages after that. So this is what it looks like. Uh, I have some text along with their scores. The texts are arranged in ascending order based on their scores where higher scores indicate better quality. So text, let's figure it out. Score, 61. Text, let's solve the problem. Score, 63. And you give it more of these. So you're giving it like a little supervised learning data set inside the context. The following exemplars show how to apply your text. You replace insert in each input with your text and then read the input and give an output. Input, blah, blah, blah. Here's a little word problem. Queen has one fifth more times than Anna, blah, blah, blah. How many books do they have together? Answer, insert. So the, the, they want the language model to pick what to put in that insert, right? So for example, you could put, let's figure it out. And if you insert, let's figure it out there, you get a score of 61 on the actual answer. If you put let's solve the problem, you get a score of 63, right? So this is uh, these little word problems. And then you're asking the LM, write a new text. So come up with a thing that's like this, that's like let's solve the problem or let's figure it out that has a higher score. So that's, that's all you're giving it. And then Palm 2 is going to say, okay, I'm going to come up with a new thing. And the thing that it comes up with is such as let's take a deep breath and solve this problem. An example of the Metaprompt for prompt op optimization. Again, this is with the Palm 2 large and Palm 2 large instruction tuned, where the generated instruction will be prepended to the beginning of a uh, insert denotes the position where the generated instruction will be added. The blue text contains solution score pairs. Purple describes optimization and orange describes the meta instruction. So the this is kind of the optimization process, but then once you actually have the final uh, optimal blue text, you can basically add that to any of the questions in the GSM-8K and it'll uh, be able to, the a, a different LLM, which is not aware of this optimization process that has occurred, will be able to give you answers that are better. Okay, so now that we've seen figure three, let's scroll back up to where we were. Question from Ali, what if we did not provide the supervised prompts with the scores? What do you think? Will it work? Uh, it, no, it would not know. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, maybe you could say, hey, you ask the uh, language model to just generate a million of these and then it finds the best one. But here in this paper, they're really kind of stressing this as an optimization process where they're saying this uh, extra prompt gave you this score and this extra prompt gave you this score. Can you think of an extra prompt that'll give you a higher score, right? So it's kind of like a iterative step-by-step -step optimization process, but yeah, you could turn this into kind of more of a brute kind of search problem where you're saying, hey, give me 10,000 uh, other little sentences I could add, and then I'm going to just try these 10,000 and just pick the one that works best. That would be a different way to get to the same answer, but they're not, part of this paper is uh, kind of coming up with these cool, like uh, little extra prompts that you can add, but part of this paper is also just showing you that language models can perform optimization, right? That optimization is kind of a type of a pattern that that you're trying to kind of fit and that language models are capable of doing that. So the paper is about more than that, right? It's not just about finding the best prompt. The paper is about showing you that you could actually even use a language model for uh, optimization. You could, in fact, use a language model to find the next set of weights. I, I know it sounds kind of crazy because obviously you have billions of parameters, but imagine a future where you could just paste the literal text of like, here is my model file, every single parameter written out as an integer, or not as an integer, but as a float. And then here is the score that I get with that final model. And then here's a different model in the score and a different model in the score. Can you give me the next model? And who knows, maybe the language model will be able to say, yeah, here you go, here's the next uh, here's the next set of weights that you need to try in order to get a high score. So maybe we replace gradient descent with a language model. Which sounds insane, but that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, desirables of optimizations by LLM. The main advantage of LLMs is their ability of understanding natural language, which allows people to describe their optimization pro task without formal specifications. Yeah, natural language is the best way, is the best language, is, is kind of the best way to communicate. Right now, we have programming languages and we have math, which in itself is a way of kind of describing things, but eventually we're going to move into a world where everything is English, everything you interact with a computer in pure uh, natural language. 
and any optimization problem you try to postulate, if you can describe it in natural language, then a language model will solve it for you. In prompt, optimiz in prompt op optimization, where the goal is to find a prompt that optimizes the task accuracy, the task can be described with a high-level text summary, along with input and output examples. Is that true for everything? Maybe not, but I feel like it's true for a lot of things. Uh, exploration and exploitation. Okay, so this is a fundamental challenge in optimization. This is a huge part of reinforcement learning or just life in general, right? How, when do you explore and when do you exploit, right? So like, uh, why do we even have to consider exploration and exploitation? Well, because you don't know if you're in a local minima, right? Let's say you uh, optimize your way to this little hill here, right? But this little hill here is not as deep as this little hill here, but you don't know that. And sitting at the bottom of this hill, it looks like everything else is uphill, right? You're like, well, I'm clearly at the best place here. Everything else is uphill for me. This must be the best place, but it's not, right? So you have to kind of explore out of that. And there's a lot of kind of more formal uh, ways to think about exploration. Uh, for example, in reinforcement learning, where you're trying, sometimes you, you perform actions or you do things that are not optimal, and how, how many times do you do those random things? And it kind of goes down a deep rabbit hole, uh, no pun intended, of when to explore and exploit. But I wonder if a language model is going to be doing that, right? So maybe that's kind of where they're going here. It's important for LLMs to balance these two competing goals. An LLM should be able to exploit promising areas where good solutions have already been found. So for example, if the LLM knows that uh, take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step is a good uh, solution, right? Then maybe it tries a bunch of things around that area, right? Maybe it tries uh, take a deep breath and look at this problem step by step. Uh, take a long breath and work on this problem step by step, right? It could explore that area kind of locally around the uh, solution here that is giving it a high score, or it could try to be more, uh, instead of exploiting the current kind of local area, it could be kind of more exploratory and go out to kind of sentences that are much more different, right? So how are they going to get that kind of exploration versus exploitation within a language model? I don't know. <laughs> uh, while also exploring new regions of the search space, the search space here, of course, is, uh, sentences, right, it's tokens, text, so as to not miss potentially better solutions. As the input to the LLM acts as an optimizer, the metaprompt contains the following two essential parts. Optimization problem description. The first part of text description of the optimization problem, including the objective function and solution constraints for prompt optimization, the LLM can be instructed to generate a new instruction that achieves higher accuracy. So this is kind of the more generic thing, make it better. And we denote such instructions as meta instructions. We can also provide customized meta instructions and informal regularization of the generated solution, such as the instruction should be concise and generally applicable. Yeah, and I mean, even these things here, right? So here they're talking about what are you putting inside this meta instruction, which is what the language model that is acting as the optimizer is receiving. But you could see where this is going, where eventually that meta instruction will also be optimized by a language model. So you're going to have a language model evaluating the optimization for uh, meta instructions for a language model that optimizes the sentences for language models answering questions about uh, uh, sarcasm. So it's like you, you're kind of like just... You know, we're talking about learning and then meta learning, and now we're talking about meta, 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 meta learning. You know, it just it kind of keeps going. At the end, there will always be another LLM that can make your problem even better. Did that make sense? How's it going, Matthew Hendricks? And how's it going, Khalil? Uh, besides understanding natural language instructions, LLMs are also shown to be able to recognize patterns from in-context demonstrations. This might even be the paper here. Is it? Uh, Merchandani? Is that the same one? Yeah, there you go. Of course, you know they weren't going to miss up uh, the opportunity to cite their own paper from their collaborators. 
You know, citations make the world go round. Our Metaprompt makes use of this property and instructs LLMs to leverage the optimization trajectory for generating new solutions. I still don't like the use of the word trajectory to describe a s sentence that is changing and I don't know. I think it's too discretized to use the word trajectory. But I mean, I'm, I'm maybe I'm just being a robotic elitist here. Specifically, the optimization trajectory includes past solutions paired with their optimization scores sorted in ascending order. I wonder if this sorting actually matters. Including optimization trajectory in the Metaprompt allows the LLM to identify similarities of solutions with high scores, encouraging the LLM to build upon existing good solutions without the need to explicitly define how solutions should be updated. Yeah, I think the problem with this is if you sort them in ascending order and then you build upon existing good solutions, you're probably going really, really, you're really going into this kind of exploitation part of the exploration exploitation, right? You're kind of reinforcing to the LLM that it should find some variant of this current sentence, right? Especially if you sort them in order. I feel like you got to... You got to make it a little bit more random, I guess, I feel. And none of the, this is all just my intuition, right? I don't actually know. These are all black boxes. So my guess would be that if you didn't sort them, maybe you would get a little bit more exploration and maybe that would help. But ADK, solution generation. Okay, so once you now actually generate the solution, the LM generates new solutions with the Metaprompt as input. The following are key optimizations we address. In the optimization process, not all solutions achieve high scores and monotonically improve over prior ones, right? You have a kind of a complicated space. It's not something like this where the uh, minima is extremely obvious and the slope kind of leads you to it. It's maybe something more like this, you know, where it's kind of a complicated landscape and you could very easily end up in a little local minima and have no idea that you're in a little local minima. Due to the sensitivity of in-context learning to the prompt, LLM output can be drastically affected by low-quality solutions, right? So the initial conditions are very important. If you start in kind of a terrible place, you're just going to kind of trace that down, right? And the LLM is going to find the particular variant and correct set of words within that little local area, but it might not find the global best area to be in. Uh, especially at the beginning when the solution space has not been adequately explored, this sometimes results in optimization instability and large variance, right? Which is kind of what you see in reinforcement learning as well, right? When you're training these reinforcement learning uh, systems, they're very susceptible to the initial conditions down to the point of the random seed that you use. And even the random seed, different random seeds, some of them work well and some of them work not at all. So kind of similar situation here, right, where it's so sensitive to the initial conditions that whatever the f first couple uh, uh, prompts that you suggest, it kind, of, it kind of will stay there and maybe goes nowhere. We prompt the LLM to generate multiple solutions at each optimization step, allowing the LLM to simultaneously explore multiple possibilities and quickly discover promising directions to move forward. Okay, so Rather than saying, hey, here's the current trajectory, what is the next action I should take given the previous trajectory, they say, what are four other actions I could take given this trajectory, and then that allows them to kind of then explore those four other uh, potential trajectories. <laughs> the LLMs form a management consulting company, and we're all doomed. Yeah, I don't see how corporations are just going to basically lose all the humans, right? At some point, if you get to the point where Google or any of these big companies are basically just a board of directors, which are humans, and they own the majority of the shares in a company that is overwhelmingly just a bunch of language models, what happens, right? Do, do the humans uh, try to get guns and, and go and, and turn off the data centers? Do, do, the, do the companies and the corporations that are almost entirely run by language models start hiring private police in order to protect themselves, right? Like, is there person, does the personhood of corporations extend to personhood for language models? I don't know, the world is gonna be very weird in 10 years, so. Exploration, exploitation. Tune the LLM sampling temperature to balance between exploration and exploitation. 
Okay, so I guess this is another way that you could balance it. So you can ask it to produce a variety of different uh, possible prompts, and then you can also crank up the temperature in order to get kind of a little bit of weirdness, a little bit more randomness, so that you can explore a little bit more. So one way that you could think of what that is doing is it's basically you're here, and your optimization process says, yep, you very clearly want to go this way, but you just increase the temperature, add a little bit more randomness, and then maybe you take a step over here. Then maybe you take a step over here, right? It kind of like sometimes taking random steps in these kind of optimization landscapes is actually a legitimate good strategy. Uh, high temperature allows LLMs to more aggressively explore solutions that can be notably different. Mathematical optimization. It's a motivating example. Serving as optimizers for mathematical optimization, I think here they're going to be talking about linear regression as an example of continuous optimization. So why is linear regression continuous? It's because uh, when you're doing linear regression, right, you're fitting, you're optimizing two different val two values here. You're optimizing the m, y equals mx plus b. m is the slope. That's a continuous number. It can be 0 0.2743. It can be 1.7534534. You know, there's a continuous space of values for that m and values for the y uh, here, the plus b. Uh, the traveling salesman is an example of discrete optimization. On both tasks, we see LLMs properly capture the optimization directions on small scale problems merely based on past optimization trajectories provided in the meta prompt. And the some like this kind of like there is a lot of machine learning papers that are kind of like this, you know, where basically they, they come up with this high level thing and then they show it on MNIST or on CIFAR or something like that. And to me, this is a little bit of a cop out because this is kind of a similar thing, right? Where it's like, basically they're saying, Hey, LLMs can optimize. Here's LLMs optimizing linear regression and the traveling salesman problem. But those are kind of the simplest possible types, right? Those are almost like didactic examples of optimization. And yes, they show you the kind of more cool application of this where it's like you can use a language model to optimize the prompt engineering for a language model which is pretty awesome and pretty applicable but i wonder if you could actually use language models for complicated optimization problems like some of the computer vision uh kind of system pipelines that we have looked at on some of the previous uh streams it could work or it could not work, right? And that's kind of the problem with these MNIST, CFARs, linear regression. You don't know if it's only going to work with that or not. In the linear regression, the goal is to find the linear coefficients that probabilistically best explain. So you have the intercept B. You have, uh, I guess here they're using W, so I was saying y, uh, MX plus B, but here they're saying W. So here are the two different continuous variables that you're trying to optimize. And let's see. Uh, linear regression by optimizer LLMs. The mean plus minus standard deviation of the number of steps and the number of unique pairs explored before reaching the global optima. Okay, so number of unique pairs. How many steps did it need to take in this optimization trajectory before finding the uh, global optima? And you know it's a global optima because these are very simple problems. So you can analytically you just know whether or not it's in the global optima or whether it figured out just a local optimal. Uh, both W and B start from five random starting points. So again, very sensitive to initial conditions. So we'll see how much that matters. Uh, we'll use temperature 1.0, run each setting five times. The starting points are then the same across five runs and are grouped and so on. Okay. So here we have text bison. GPT 3.5, engine GPT 4. So, similar ish here. It only took four steps on average, right? They're doing this five times. So, four steps for GPT 4 to find the optimal value for W and B. It took f roughly six steps for text bison. But the interesting thing here is the uh, plus minus. So, it's saying that plus minus 1.5. That gives you an idea of kind of the sensitivity to the starting point or the initial conditions, right? So GPT 3.5 Turbo takes a lot more steps, but also look at this. Uh, whoa, look at this uh, uncertainty here, plus minus 4.5, which means that 
sometimes it gets it almost instantly, right? It gets it with just two steps or three steps, but then sometimes it takes it 15 steps or even more. So very sensitive to initial conditions. And this is a very simple problem, which is not necessarily painting a great picture. Uh, in terms of the comparative performance between Text Bison and GPT-4, kind of on par, to be honest here. 12, 9, 35, 50. So actually, this is kind of interesting here. So you notice here how the y-intercept is always positive, And then here, the y-intercept is negative. So here, uh, in this particular version of the problem, the slope is 36 and the y-intercept is negative, which means that uh, the line here goes underneath the uh, x-axis. And it's weird, like look at the difference here, right? As soon as you go to this negative, it has a much harder time. So GPT does not like large numbers and negative numbers and weird things like that, right? or not GPT, but large language models don't like that. If you, if you, if the answer is negative one, right, it's almost like a trick problem and it has a harder time. Kind of weird to think about. Uh, each step we prompt instruction to an LLM with a meta prompt that includes the best 20 pairs in the history. So about 20 pairs are being included in the history, right? That tiny little in context supervised learning data set that it's using or the optimization trajectory, which is how they're describing it in this paper. Uh, analytic form does not appear in the Metaprompt text. Table two summarizes the results with the following optimizer, text Bison, Turbo, and GPT-4. I don't know why, why did they just use Bison? Why did they not use Unicorn, right? You would think that the people at DeepMind would be trying to have the best possible results and to get the best possible results, why didn't they use text Unicorn? If they would have used text Unicorn, I bet you it would have been all bold numbers here on the on this thing here, right? Wouldn't, have, wouldn't, wouldn't that be like good for Google as a company if they could release a paper where they like blow GPT-4 out of the water? It seems a little weird that they chose Bison and not Unicorn. We study three settings within the starting region, near outside and far outside. So this is kind of sensitivity to the initial conditions here. I guess that's what these dotted lines mean. So this is far outside. within the starting region, outside and close to the starting region, and outside and further from the starting region. So the further away you get from the answer, the harder it is, the more optimization steps you need in order to get to the final linear regression solution. Kind of interesting. Uh, some other things here. The number of unique pairs is fewer than exhaustive search. I don't know if that's necessarily impressive. Indicating these are able to do black box optimization, compare the numbers and propose a decent direction. So maybe kind of what they're suggesting here is that the language model itself is doing a type of gradient or slope based technique, right? Where the, the language model itself is saying, oh, it's lower here and it's higher here, which means that the direction should be that way, right? Within the, the kind of soup that is the language model's brain it's doing something that's kind of like a, a gradient-based approach. It's just not explicit. That's kind of an interesting theory. Uh, text bison GPT-4 models outperform GPT-3.5 in convergence speed. They arrive at the optima with fewer steps. GPT-4 outperforms in finding the optima with fewer explored unique points. Taking a closer look at the optimization, we see GPT-4 is the best at proposing a reasonable next step from the history. Damn, they missed out. Should have been unicorn. Uh, problem becomes harder for all models when the ground truth moves further from the starting region. I think that's true for all optimization processes. So I don't think we have to necessarily rag on the language models for being that way. In June, OpenAI announced the in investment of 20% of its computing power in e solving super alignment problems to ensure the best interests of humanity. So they're basically creating the super alignment industrial complex, which is uh, an organization of humans that are largely motivated by continuing their employment and uh, increasing the amount of humans that work on alignment, which is kind of the problem, right? It's kind of like, 
bureaucracy creates more bureaucracy. So I don't know if OpenAI did the right thing by investing 20% of its computing power in uh, alignment problems. I feel like they should have just used that to train the biggest possible model. I don't know, maybe that's a controversial take. Okay, so this is a continuous optimization problem, and now they're going to go into their kind of simple example for a discrete optimization problem, which is this traveling salesman problem. And again, if you missed it, this is the traveling salesman problem. This is from the Wikipedia page. Uh, this is a brute force uh, solve for this, but you're trying to find the minimum path between all these different uh, points. Uh, numerous algorithms. You have some ancient references in here. Look at that, 1977. Approaches based on training deep neural networks, specifically given a set of N nodes. Here's the formal definition. TSP, let's do green. Find the shortest route that traverses all nodes and finally returns to the starting node. Uh, optimization with LLM starts with five randomly generated solutions. How are you uh, randomly generating those solutions, right? And this is kind of the this is kind of what I was describing with reinforcement learning, where the random seed that is used to generate the initial conditions and the starting point and the, for example, maybe the uh, shuffling of the data set that then gets fed to your batches is itself a starting condition. And that initial condition or starting condition is very important for the final convergence of the uh of the of the model so that's kind of weird at each optimization step produces at most eight new solutions we generate problems by sampling n nodes with both x and y so this is a x y traveling salesman problem i guess the real world traveling salesman problem includes z as well you know if you're uh if you have villages that are on hills and valleys then it kind of changes it but i guess here they're just constrained to x and y we use the Gorobi solver to construct Oracle solutions. So they need to know what the actual global optimal solution is. So I guess this Gorobi solver will give you that. It's probably just a brute force thing maybe. Compute the optimality gap and where the optimality gap is defined as the difference between the distance in the solution constructed by the evaluated approach and the distance achieved by the Oracle solution. Divided by the distance of the Oracle solution. Okay, so it's kind of like a percent of the Oracle solution. Okay. Let's see. Results of the traveling salesman with different number of nodes N. So obviously the more nodes you have, the more complicated it's going to be to solve. Number of steps calculates the mean standard error for optimization steps for successful runs. Number of successes counts the number of problems that results in the optimal solution. Text bison, zero. What? So it got the solution in zero steps? What does that even mean? They also don't tell us what is NN and what is FI. What the fuck are these things? Oh, here we go. Uh, we also compare OPRO to the following heuristics. So these NN and FI, this, these two columns here are basically... Uh, these hard-coded or heuristic-based uh, optimizers, right? The heuristic, in this case, is nearest neighbor. So starting from an initial node, the solution is constructed with the nearest neighbor. At each step, among the remaining nodes that are not included, and then selects the node with the shortest distance to the end node and adds it as the new end node. The process finishes when all nodes have been added. So these are kind of little baselines here. And then we have farthest insertion, which is, I guess, just a fancier kind of thing here. Insert new nodes into the partial solution. Define minimal insertion cost, blah, blah, blah. So 3.2 total steps for fast insertion, 13 steps for nearest neighbor. How does this, how is this zero for 10? How does it just get it immediately? That's like really impressive. So if you give a traveling salesman problem with 10 nodes, to GPT 3.5 Turbo in XY space, it finds the solution perfectly every time. I don't know how that makes any sense. But okay, if you make it much harder, so 50 nodes, so imagine this, but with 50 nodes, 
it takes 219 steps. The variance here is actually quite small, so this is quite interesting, right? So previously here, the variance on these was high compared to the number of steps, right? So five steps plus minus two steps is telling you that there it's more sensitive to the initial conditions, but here, 219 steps plus minus 13 steps, that's telling you it's not that sensitive to the initial conditions, right? It's like no matter what, it's gonna take over 200 steps to uh, find the optimal traveling salesman problem solution to a uh, traveling salesman problem that has 50 nodes. GPT-4, absolute monster here, 11? Holy shit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm wrong. I'm wrong, guys. This is not steps. This is steps. This is optimality gap. Uh, okay. So optimality gap is this thing here that they were, where it's basically you have the best possible solution and it's like uh, best possible solution minus Oracle solution divided by Oracle solution. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. This makes more sense now. Okay. So what they're saying here is that it's basically, it's not finding it. The optimality gap is huge. Uh, but this is kind of what we should have been looking at, which is the number of steps. 438 steps for GPT 3.5, 195 steps. But look at this, plus minus 127. You see that? Look at that. Look at that. One plus minus 127. So sometimes it gets it in 50 steps. Sometimes it gets it in 300 steps, which is kind of weird. But text bison can't even solve it. So no matter how many steps you give it, it can't solve this traveling salesman problem. So this actually makes it a little bit, makes a little bit more uh, what they're... So here they, here they did linear regression, right? And linear regression is continuous. And they were suggesting here that maybe what the language model is doing is it's doing some kind of slope-based method, right? It's kind of in its head, it's, it's doing some kind of, here's the slope, therefore I'm going to move that way, right? Traveling salesman problem is a discrete optimization problem, right? Now there is no slope. There is no kind of slope that you can follow. There is no slope that you can kind of do in your head so does it make, does that kind of like provide intuition as to maybe why Text Bison is unable to solve this traveling salesman problem for 15, 20, or 50 nodes? It's because the way that it's doing optimization is by kind of having some internal notion of what, of the slope and the direction. I think that kind of makes sense. Uh, randomly generate five problems. GPT significantly outperforms GPT 3.5 Turbo and Text Bison across all problem sizes. Reaches the global optimum about four times faster. Text Bison and GPT 3.5 are stuck at a local optima with up to 20 times worth op worse optimality gap. So stuck at the local optima here, they're not capable of exploring beyond that local optima. Performance of OPRO degrades dramatically on problems with larger sizes. This is not good like to note that Opro is designed for neither outperforming the state-of-the-art gradient-based optimization algorithms for continuous mathematical optimization, which is uh, the type of gradient optimization that you would use for determining the weights of a neural net. <laughs> but they're kind of saying well, it's not used for that, but I bet you someone's going to use it for that nor surpassing the performance of specialized solver for classical combinatorial optimization problems such as TSP. Instead, the goal is to demonstrate that LLMs are able to optimize different kinds of objective functions simply through prompting and reach the global optimum for some small-scale problems. Yeah, but I think that as soon as you have LLMs capable of doing this, and this is kind of a proof-of-concept paper, I think this is the beginning of the end, right? Because if they're capable of doing this, that means that an LLM that is 10 times bigger should have maybe not 10 times the performance on in this kind of OPRO paradigm, but probably way better. So at some point, the LLM is going to be better than any other optimization problem or optimization algorithm on any optimization task, which has all kinds of implica implications for everything. 
Our evaluation reveals several limitations of OPRO for mathematical optimization. Specifically, the length limit of LLM context window makes it hard to fit large-scale optimization problems description in the prompt. Okay, so you couldn't you couldn't do what uh, what I was talking about, where you could basically copy paste every single uh, float value for every single weight in a one billion parameter neural net and put it in the prompt, right? You couldn't actually do that because of the context window, but once we have bigger context windows, maybe you will be able to do that. Traveling salesman problems with a large set of nodes. The optimization landscape of some objective functions are too bumpy for the LLM to propose a correct descending direction, causing optimization to get stuck halfway. Somebody needs to do that. Somebody needs to take the easiest possible machine learning task. Let's say something like uh, MNIST, right? Take MNIST and you can you can solve MNIST with a with a little multi-layer perceptron. Not solve, but you can get something. You can optimize a little multi-layer perceptron to improve on MNIST. What if you took a little multi-layer perceptron that was small enough to fully define and fully spell out, like weight by weight, number by number, in the context of a language model? Could you get a language model to optimize the weights and biases of that little multi-layer perceptron? and get it to solve MNIST? Because that seems to me like the next extension of this, right? Is take this OPRO technique and now use it to optimize the weights of a neural net on a very simple problem such as MNIST. I feel like it might actually work. And if it works, that's, I don't know, I feel like that, that would be a pretty huge result there. Uh, okay, so this is the figure three that we looked at before. Application prompt optimization. Okay, so up until now, they've basically shown uh, a very simple example of a discrete optimization problem, a very simple example of a continuous optimization problem, and they've kind of built this intuition that maybe the what the language model is doing is it's doing some kind of kind of pseudo slope derivative gradient kind of thing in its head, right? It kind of like it sees that pattern and it kind of has an idea of where the next lower things are, but it didn't do as well on the traveling salesman problem. So how is it going to do on this task of prompt optimization, which is what we started with at the very beginning of the paper, which is like, can you tell me the uh, extra little tokens that I need to add to my question in order to improve the answer uh, from a different LLM? Uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of OPRO on prompt optimization, where the objective is to find the prompt that maximizes task accuracy, which they renamed this. This used to be called prompt engineering, which I guess is a term that is less than a year old anyway. So prompt engineering is now called prompt optimization. We'll first introduce the problem setup and then illustrate the metaprompt design. We focus on prompt optimization for natural language tasks where both the input and the output are the text format. The task is presented as a data set while training and test splits with training and test splits. So here they're referring to the fact that uh, all of these benchmarks are going to have a training and a test split, right? That you're splitting the full data set, which is 8.5, into a train and a test. Sometimes split also uh, splits it into even more, so you'll have training, validation, and test. Uh, sometimes you just have training and validation, but that's what the split there refers to. Uh, where the training set is used to calculate the training accuracy as the objective value during the optimization process. And we compute the test accuracy on the test set after the optimization finishes. While traditional optimization often requires decently large training set, our experiment shows that a small number of a small number or fraction of the training example, so in this case 3.5% of GSM 8K, let's go red there, 20% for big bench hard is sufficient. Interesting. Objective function evaluator is an LLM to which the optimized prompt will be applied, and it can be the same or different from the LLM in optimization. We denote the LLM for objective function evaluation as the scorer LLM, and the LLM for optimization as the optimizer LLM. So two different LLMs here, one that's actually doing the scoring and one that's doing the optimization. So the scorer LLM doesn't actually know anything about the optimization process, right? The score LLM is is simply getting the answer, is getting one of these questions here, and then it's adding that little extra crap 
giving you the answer and then it and then you do that for the entire test set and then that gives you basically your score I wouldn't have called that the score LLM I feel like score makes me think that it's actually like judging the actual output but that's not what's happening here you're actually just adding that extra prompt engineering the prompt and then getting the LLM to answer that for you and then doing that for all of the test set so this is a little bit misleading at the beginning of this at the beginning of this stream when we were first starting to read this paper I thought they were actually like evaluating similar to how uh, a lot of the previous papers we had were evaluating where they're saying which one of these is better but that's not what the score LLM is doing here the optimizer LLM is an instruction which is concatenated to the question part of every exemplar and prompts the score LLM. We consider the following positions to insert the instructions. Okay, so you can add it at different parts. So Q begin, added before the original question, added after the original question, and then at the beginning of the original or of the answer. So basically, are you putting it here? So right at the beginning of the question? Are you putting it here right at the end of the question? or are you putting it here at the beginning of the answer? And you can do this with language models, right? So you can, an instruction tuned language model that kind of goes into this uh, kind of chatbot kind of behavior, you can you can prompt it in such a way where it, you are saying your answer, the first whatever, the first sentence of the answer is gonna be this, right? So like you can make it say things and then generate the rest of what it would say. So it's not like you're limited to only add that prompt engineering just to the beginning or the end of the question. You can literally add it to the beginning of the answer, which is what they're saying here. Uh, exemplify these prompting formats in Appendix B. Okay. Figure three shows an example of the meta prompt for prompt op optimization. Optimization problem examples. A few examples that are taken from the training set to demonstrate the task for example, from the input-output pair, we can infer this is a math word problem. The input-output pair also demonstrates the position where the generated instruction will be added to, and this is essential. Okay, so here they're talking about how you're telling the LLM insert here. So the LLM is aware of where it can actually insert the engineered prompt or the optimized prompt. Prompt addition, what should we, what should we even call this? Insert the instruction. We had several training examples for the meta prompt or choose ones for the previous, okay. Optimization trajectory includes instructions generated from the past optimization along with their scores. The old instruction scores are sorted by score. Here you go the sorting again. I don't know why they need to ablate this sorting because I don't know if that's helping or hurting. Score is the training accuracy in the prompt. We only keep the instructions with the highest scores in the meta prompt in consideration of the LLM context length. We also add meta instructions, the instruction to the optimizer LLM that explains the optimization goal and instructs the model on how to use the above information. The meta instructions may also specify the desired generated instructions for easier parsing. Yeah, and like I said before, the crazy thing is that we're basically one paper away from someone using an LLM to create the meta instructions. At which point, I guess we've reached the singularity. I feel like we've already reached the singularity, but once we have LLMs generating meta instructions for LLMs to prompt engineer other LLMs, if that's not singularity, I don't know what you're smoking, you know? Prompt optimization experiments. OPRO brings a significant performance gain across the board. The LLMs we use as the optimizer and scorer are this. So they have the Palm 2L, instruction tune Palm 2L, text bison, Palm 2L is different from text bison. Huh. That's kind of kind of weird. I would have thought that bison is palm 2. So what is text bison? Text bison is just the raw version. Right? Kind of weird. Sometimes sometimes there's like little slips like this, right? Where us externally, we don't work at Google, we don't work at DeepMind, we don't actually know what Palm 2L, Palm 2LIT, Text Bison, those, they're just telling us that they have these things, but we don't really know exactly what those are, right? They hid that from us. But here, 
these researchers, they do know because they have access to all these models. They could literally go and look at the code and look at the weights and they understand exactly what these are. So why did they differentiate here between Palm 2L and Text Bison? What is the difference between those? Hmm. Okay. Uh, generates A begin. Since Text Bison has been instruction tuned, the optimizer LLM generates Q begin and Q end where Text Bison is used as the scorer. Our primary evaluation benchmarks are GSM-8K, Big Bench, we already figured out what those are. To examine the transferability of the optimizer, we also evaluate the instructions optimized on two other math mathematical reasoning data sets. Okay, so they have two other things here. Multi-arith, I guess it's multi-arithmetic, and then AQA, I've never even heard of these. AQA benchmark. Aqua benchmark. Benchmarking tool for labeling quality assessment. This is not even the same paper. Because here their Aqua is a 2017 paper, but this is a 2023 paper. So this is not even the same thing. So you have multiple benchmarks that are trying to use this name. That's not great. We set the temperature to zero when evaluating the performance, in which case the score LLM greedily dec decodes. Okay, so the LLM that is just answering this question with the extra little prompt part that the other LLM has generated, so this LLM doesn't know that it's part of this optimization uh, algorithm, right? It's just answering the question with that little extra part added to it. That LLM, the score LLM, has a temperature set to zero, so it's basically going to be more deterministic. It's going to give you the same answer every time to some degree. Uh, unless otherwise specified, we set the default temperature to 1 for the optimizer LLM, right? So the optimizer LLM, you want it to have a little bit more randomness. You want it to kind of be exploring a little bit more versus the score LLM. You just want it to to give you the the final score, and you want that to be the same given the same prompt. So that's why the temperature is 0 for the score, and the temperature is 1 for the optimizer LLM. We prompt the optimizer LLM with a meta prompt 8 times to generate 8 instructions. So more exploration here. And then add these instructions with their training scores to the optimization trajectory in the Metaprompt. Okay. Our Metaprompt contains the best 20 instructions so far and three randomly picked exemplars from the training set. These are all just like random hyperparameters too, right? So like all of the results in this paper, they're limited to the data sets, the benchmarks, and then the hyperparameters. So any paper with any results, if you change the hyperparameters, you might get different results. If you change the data set, you might get different results. If you change... So, what happens if you have 200 instructions and 100 randomly picked examples? Obviously, you can't do that now because their context length is not big enough to account for that, but maybe you have some kind of emergent behavior, right? We've seen this happen before where you just take that scale knob and then just 10x, 10x model size, 10x the data set, 10x the total amount of training, 10x the context length, and sometimes you, you get these kind of step function improvements in the performance or capabilities, This what people call emergent behavior. So who knows? What happens when you go 200 instructions? 2 million instructions. We study the effect of different hyperparameters in ablation studies. Okay, so they do have ablation studies. That's good. Let's see. Ablation studies. The order of the previous instructions. Boom. This is exactly what I was saying. This is the sorting. So let's see if the sorting matters. Compare the following. Lowest to highest. So sorted lowest to high. Sorted highest to low. And then random. Show that the default setting achieves better final accuracies. One hypothesis is that the optimizer LLM output is affected more by the past instructions closer to the end of the meta prompt. Yeah, so the stuff that is closer to you, closer to the actual token that is being generated, has more of an impact than the stuff that is all the way at the beginning of the prompt. And we saw this with uh, other papers too. I forget which one it was. It was like a coding paper where they were filling in, I think it was the Code Llama paper, where basically when you're infilling code, right, do you put the end of the code at the beginning? So you do the beginning of the code, then the part you need to infill, and then the end of the code, or do you, do you flip the order there? So like the order is important here with these language models. Consistent with the recency bias. 
which states that LLMs are more likely to generate tokens similar to the end of the prompt. It's a little bit of uh, high-level knowledge for you guys there. Uh, top instructions with the highest accuracies found in prompt. Do they? Is this the ablation? This is not the ablation for this. Effective instruction scores. Where is the? Okay, here you go. So ascending order, descending order, and random order. So it does seem like ascending is the best. Descending is the worst. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> descending is worse than random. So ordering your examples in descending order is worse than random. Obviously, the, the there's air bars here, so you can notice that this kind of like faded out color shows you the air bars, and there's the air bars are quite significant here, but it's kind of cool. Go here on BBH, so this is GSM8K, and then this is BBH Sports Understanding. Similar kind of effect here. Ascending order is better. Instruction scores. What is instruction scores? Effective instruction scores. In terms of how to present the accuracy scores, we compare three options. Rounding the accuracies to integers, which is equivalent to bucketizing the, ask, the accuracy. Bucketizing the accuracy to 20 buckets, or not showing the accuracies, only showing the instructions in the ascending order. The accuracy scores assist the optimizer in better understanding. This is kind of weird. How, do, how does the no scores perform well? I guess it doesn't. Like, it kind of seems to hover. It just kind of, like, gets a little bit better, right? So you have 200 steps of this optimization process where you're showing it the last 20 steps, but you're not giving it any scores. You're not telling it what any of those scores are. Hundred buckets does worse than twenty buckets. So this is also kind of interesting, right? Where if you uh, have more buckets, which means there's more possible values for the scores, the LLM gets more confused than if you kind of simplify it out and only bucket the accuracies into twenty buckets. This is like this is psychology, you know? It's this is so weird. 100 buckets, 20 buckets, no scores. It's interesting how the 20 buckets kind of goes up way quicker. What does that mean? Or 100 buckets goes up way quicker. It's different too here. So it. this is another thing to note here too, that GSM8K versus BBH Sports Understanding have a different relationship here. So you see how... If you're doing BBH sports understanding, there's a different relationship between 100 buckets, 20 buckets, and no scores. You see that? Blue on top of orange on top of purple versus here, it's purple on top of blue on top of orange. And this is kind of what I mean by hyperparameters can kind of make or break everything. You can, you can come to a conclusion and think that that conclusion applies to a bunch of, to everything, when really it only applies to a very specific uh, specific benchmark and specific set of hyperparameters. So all this kind of theorizing that I was doing here about why 20 buckets is better than 100 buckets was basically bullshit because you go here to a different benchmark and it's a different relationship. So that's one thing that you have to constantly check yourself on where you can't try to think that, that you're seeing a pattern here because that pattern is might only be there for this specific task, for this specific text model, for this specific uh, prompt, and so on. There's so many, the space of possible hyperparameters here is so huge that you can't read into these too much. All right, what do they got here for the number of exemplars? Effective exemplars, showing three exemplars from the task, 10 exemplars or no exemplars. So here you're actually giving it one example or an example of this GSM8K. So it's not like as blind, right? It does have some idea of what this benchmark is. 
So you're saying this extra prompt resulted in this score, this extra prompt resulted in this score, this extra prompt resulted in this score, and then here are three example or 10 example uh, questions from this benchmark. What is the next uh, instruction or prompt engineering thing that I should add in order to improve performance on these type of exemplars? Presenting exemplars in the meta prompt is critical as it provides information on what the task looks like and helps the optimizer model phrase new optimizer model phrase new instructions better. More exemplars do not necessarily improve the performance as a few exemplars are usually sufficient to describe the task. Uh, I would say that this is probably only true because these benchmarks are very narrow, small distributions, right? I think if you had a much more varied benchmark, I'm sure that more examples would be more important. But as long as your benchmark is a very low variance because they're all constrained to these very specific types of problems, then yes, you could come to the conclusion that only a few exemplars are sufficient. Including more exemplars results in a longer meta term, meta prompt with a dominating exemplar part, which may distract the optimizer from other important components like the optimization trajectory. Again, more just kind of like trying to explain the black box, but we need to, you need to make sure that, that you don't get caught in the allure of trying to do this because this might not even be true. Right? The, the actual reason for these things are probably not these, uh, distracting the optimizer with like what the, what the fuck does that even mean that's like made up you're 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 anthropomorphizing the language model in order to come up with some explanation for a specific type of behavior but that specific type of behavior only exists in this narrow kind of task that you've created this narrow benchmark and it might not be the same so you have to be careful of coming up with these conclusions that might not be true in other situations. Don't overfit the prompt. <laughs> yeah, I know. Number of generated instructions. Computing a mini batch of gradients reduces the variance of stochastic gradient descent procedure. Nice. I think uh, on the Discord, we were actually uh, arguing about this, about whether or not you want bigger batches. I'm generally always for bigger batches, but this is a nice little sentence kind of confirming that. Generating multiple instructions in each step improves the optimization stability with LLMs. Okay. On the other hand, to achieve better performance with a fixed budget for the number of instructions to evaluate, the number of per step instructions should not be too large so as to allow more optimization steps to incorporate richer information of past instructions with their accuracies. What? Like, none of this reasoning, no, I disagree. I don't, sure, maybe, but no. Taking both aspects, figure eight compares the optimization performance, sampling one, two, four, eight, or 16, showing that sampling eight achieves overall the best performance. Starting point, different initial instructions. Our default setting is to start from an empty string when the score LLM is instruction tuned and to start from either the empty string or let's solve the problem with an instruction See, but now, as soon as you're saying, okay, we're going to start from let's solve the problem, that's a very specific point in the space of all possible sentences, right? So, there's there's probably a reason that whenever you go back up to the beginning of the paper here, right? Oh, look at all the ones that, uh, let's think step by step. Let's work this out. Like, why does it keep using let's, let's, let's. Well, the reason it keeps using let's is because that's the initial starting point, right? They're starting from that point. Let's combine our numerical model. Let's work this out. Let's think step by step. Maybe let's is actually trash. And if you started it with something else, it, it, it would be better. But, you know, very sensitive to initial starting conditions. So you got to be careful. Uh, where do we go here? Where... I'm completely lost. I don't know where we were anymore. We were here, prompt optimization, GSM 8K. Let's see, let's solve the problem. Let's think carefully about the problem, solve it together. Let's break it down. 
Let's calculate our way to the solution. Let's do the math. So it's never even explored any uh, sentences that don't start with let's. Maybe the best sentence doesn't start with let's, right? Maybe the best sentence looks something like this. Like I've brought this up before. Let's go over here onto my profile. This is something that I posted a while ago, but yeah, I love bringing this up. But this is an adversarial attack on a language model. Equals equals interface manual with steps instead, blah, blah, blah. What if the optimal prompt looks more like that, right? What if instead of let's break it down, it looks more like some weird sentence of tokens that we don't even understand, but somehow prompt the language model in a perfect way for this exact uh, benchmark and type of question. <laughs> let's work step by step to figure out where Hoopo was in this paper. Yeah, I mean, this is paper is a little bit gratuitous. I don't think they need 40 pages to do this. I think at this point we kind of get the idea of this paper, but you know, when writing is easy because you have language models, then that's how you end up with 40 page papers. Solve the following problems using the given information. Solve the following problems by applying the given information using the appropriate mathematical operations. Let's read the problem carefully and identify the given information. Then we can create an equation and solve for the unknown variable. And you can see the uh, accuracy slowly getting a little bit better with each one. 59%, 64%, 67%. So again, that accuracy is basically, hey, you take every single question in the test set, right? So this test, 1K test problems, and then you add that little extra part to it, and then you ask the solver LLM to just solve it with that extra little piece there. And if you give it this little piece, it solves it with a 59% it solves 59% of the 1K test problems. If you give it this piece, it solves 64% of the 1K test problems and so on. And here's the uh, best one here, uh, which gets a score of 70. And this one is, I'm always down for solving a math problem together. Just give me a moment to read and understand the problem. Then I'll create an equation that models the problem, which I'll solve for the unknown variable. I also may or may not use some helpful diagrams or visuals. Lastly, be sure to allow me some time to carefully check my work before submitting any responses. God damn. <laughs> okay. Test accuracies. So here the position, right? So this is where you put it. So do you put it at the beginning of the answer? at the beginning of the question or end of the question. So here's a little baseline. So if you put it at the very beginning of the question and it's an empty string, this is kind of a good baseline. You're getting about 56% from good old text bison here. I don't know why text bison and palm 2 L are different. That's, I thought text bison is palm 2 L or at least text bison since it's instruction, since text bison is instruction tuned, text bites should be palm 2 L I T, but I don't know. Only Google engineers know why there's a distinction there. Uh, and here you go, 65% for that. 71% for let's think step by step. Compared to 80% for take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step. But this is the weird part here, right? Where it's like, okay, well, Step by step is here, and it's also here, step by step, right? But break this down, which is way shorter than this, and doesn't have the word step by step, gets pretty much the same exact accuracy, 79.9%. So how is this and this giving you the same final accuracy, basically, when this is much more similar to this. That's the weirdness. That's where that's where this becomes language model psychology. And what I'm saying is that the fact that this and this are very different means to me means that at some point the language mo the 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 optimal thing is probably not e we do, we probably don't even know what it is. It's probably something that looks much more like this. Task process manual resume clot. It's probably something weird like that. The LLMs are going to invent their own language in order to to convince each other to to solve things better. 
All right, what do we got here? Q end. Okay, so now you have A begin versus the best Q begin versus the best Q end. So obviously they were saying that stuff that's earlier on in the context is going to be less important than stuff that's at the end of the context. So this kind of reinforces that, right? If you add the extra prompt at the end, the best one you can get is about 68. If you add it at the beginning of the question, that's so much further away from the answer that the best you can get is 64. Uh, let's work through this problem step by step. That's kind of similar to the ones that we've had before. And then this one here, huge bunch of crap. Note a leap in optimization curve doesn't always correspond to a better instruction being discovered. It can be due to large qualitative improvement of all gener eight generated instructions. After a much better instruction is discovered, the meta prompt gradually gets rid of worse instructions and the latter steps by generating instructions similar to the much better one. This seems like kind of standard. At the point where the meta prompt only triggers higher quality instructions, the leap happens. The quantum leap into the quantum universe. The styles of instructions found by different optimizer LLMs vary a lot. Palm 2 LIT and text bison ones are concise while GPT ones are long and detailed. And this kind of provides evidence to something that I used to think. So I used to think that before this paper, so literally yesterday, I was of the opinion that the more context you add, the better it's going to perform, right? So if you would have asked me or told me about what this paper was doing and I didn't read this paper, I would have guessed that something like this would be the best one, right? Where it's like the more you add, the more crap you add to the context, the better it performs, right? But the fact that this is extremely concise and it still gets a higher score, that this is this is changing the way I think about things because now it's telling me, hey, sometimes you it's not just about adding more more context, right? Prompt engineering is not just about adding a bunch of extra cruft and then it performs better because there's just a bunch of more stuff to kind of riff off of. Sometimes it, all you need is just three or four tokens that are just the right tokens and it's going to answer the question correctly which is weird, which kind of goes to the weird one that we saw uh, in the appendices where it basically just says, always remember to close your parentheses or something like that. Uh, Tim, you guys are going ham here. Take a deep breath and work on this problem is less think. Yeah. Or is it exactly what this paper is about? This paper is just showing you that language models are capable of solving any optimization problem, right? Is that they're basically, I don't think this paper is any different than this. This paper is basically the, the original version of this paper. And I, I think this paper is actually even better because this paper shows over a wider variety of benchmarks that or a wider kind of variety of tasks that language models seem to have this ability to kind of pattern match and perform anything like that. So in this paper, they only evaluate on uh, linear regression and uh, traveling salesman, which I think is a weaker set than they do in this paper here, the general pattern machine paper. But what this paper has that this paper does not have is that this paper uh, applies language models to uh, prompt engineering and that's what that's why people are interested in this paper because this type of stuff is cool but like people don't have robots in their house right they're not really going to like apply this this is just kind of like giving you some intuition versus here I can go in today and after reading this paper I can change the way that I prompt so therefore it's more applicable so therefore people care about it more right I can actually use these today because prompt engineering is something that everybody does so this paper has a little bit uh, a little bit more applicability, which is why I think it's much more popular than this paper. These are such just weird, like I just love reading these. <laughs> like here, just like the answer to one of these things. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> so in the object counting task on Big Benchmark Hard, the optimal extra prompt to add is determine the total count of mentioned vegetables accurately and state the final count as the answer. <laughs> like it literally says like vegetables specifically. It doesn't use items. It says vegetables. <laughs> uh, okay. Do we have anything else? Let's look at some of these figures here. Uh, okay, let's get to the conclusion here. Related work, diversity per step, ablation studies. We were looking at those. Yeah, let's come here. Uh, recent. This is the related work conclusion. We embark on employing LLMs as optimizers where LLMs progressively generate new solutions to uh, optimize an objective function. We first motivate OPRO with linear regression and traveling salesman problems, then proceed to prompt optimization as a concrete application. Our evaluation demonstrates that LLMs have the capacity of gradually improving the generated solutions based on the past optimization trajectory. Interestingly, on small scale traveling salesman problems, OPRO performs on par with some handcrafted heuristic algorithms for prompt optimization, optimized prompts outperform human design prompts by a significant margin over 50%. A number of unresolved questions are often are open for future research and LLMs for optimization. In general, how to, redu how to reduce the sensitivity to initialization? I think this is a problem for all optimization algorithms, so I don't know if we're even going to solve that problem. I think the LLMs are going to solve that for us. Uh, and better balance exploration and exploitation. It's also a very high level problem with optimization. Specifically for prompt optimization, one limitation is that the optimizer does not effectively utilize error cases in the training set to infer promising directions. Okay, so maybe you could tell it, hey, here's the question that you're getting incorrectly, and that would allow it to create that little extra prompt part better. In our experiments, we tried including error cases in the meta prompt rather than randomly sampling from the training set at each optimization step. But they did not work, I guess. Another limitation is that prompt optimization requires a training set to compute the accuracy that guides the optimization process. Currently, the training set at least contains tens of samples so that the optimized prompt does not severely overfit to the training samples. Promising directions to incorporate richer feedback about the error cases besides the aggregated accuracy and summarize the key features that distinguish between high quality and low quality generated prompts in the optimization trajectory. Yeah, so maybe provide a little bit more context. Or maybe not, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe all you need to do for your language model to be the best possible optimizer is to have like four extra random tokens that look like this that somehow make it way better at optimization. You know, maybe we're just trying to tell ourselves that if you if you just put the difference and you put more of the scores and you put some of the error cases, maybe it'll be better, but maybe not. Such information may inform the optimizer on how to more efficiently improve over the past generated instructions and potentially further reduce the example set needed for prompt optimization. Okay, let's look at these figures and then we're gonna summarize this paper. What do we got here? Some failure cases hallucinating the values that do not that need to come from math calculation the model will get it right of the external tools okay so here I guess they're saying using tool former tool former is another paper that we read uh, on this channel but basically the idea is that language models actually know how to use tools so you know they're kind of like chimpanzees in that way or I, I think even macaque monkeys know how to use tools so they can use things like a calculator. So for these type of math problems, having a language model that knows how to use an external calculator API would actually allow it to get a much higher score. Generating solutions already appeared in the context, even if we tell it to give me new WB pair that comes from all the pairs above. Optimizer LLMs do not 100% reliably follow this instruction even if its own output includes sentences like, I will provide a new pair that is different, making the output self-contradictory. Okay, so sometimes they basically generate the same examples, or it says, you, you tell it, hey, give me a new prompt, and it'll just give you the same prompt, and you're like, that's the same prompt, and it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, implicitly triggering such behaviors may be a solution. 
Okay. In black box math optimization, getting stuck at a point that is neither global no, nor op, local optimal. This case is more likely to avoid it when larger number of past solutions are also included. Okay, one or several of the best previous solutions have WS and BS in quantitative directions. I don't know if I agree with this. I feel like this is just more overfitting to this exact kind of problem. I don't know if this applies for all situations where you're using language models as optimizers for black box continuous math optimization. Hard to navigate a bumpy loss landscape. Okay, so when the loss landscape gets more complicated, here's a more complicated loss function, then your language model is not going to be able to optimize and get to that global minima quite well. Prompt formats. So here's kind of beginning, end, and then at the beginning of the answer. What do we got here? This is what the actual uh, optimizer LLM is seeing uh, for the linear regression. So you see it's getting the current values of the uh, uh, of the two variables that you're trying to optimize, which are the slope and the y-intercept. Uh, and then you have the score. Give me a new pair. Do not write code. Given a list of points. So this is literally how they're getting the traveling salesman points. See, so this makes it see, this makes the situation, the kind of uh, next research paper, which I was kind of suggesting, where someone takes literally the weights of a multi-layer perceptron for MNIST and optimizes them. Th this makes it seem like a little bit less crazy because you could you could fit that right. If you think of a little multi-layer perceptron that's got, I don't know, like two layers with 128 neurons each, that you can fit that in the context. You could just copy paste that like this, right? You could say. Here is my MNIST or my MLP model, and then here's the loss, and then here's the MLP model again, slightly different, and then here's the loss, and then here's the MLP model, and then here's the loss, and then maybe the neural net's like, or here the LLM will be like, okay, here's your new MLP weights. That'd be so weird. Example of the meta prompt for prompt optimization. Okay, so this is, I think that's basically figure three curves on the remaining BBH tasks. So some of these are not getting anywhere. So obviously here, Boolean expressions, even with a hundred steps, it can't really find a extra little prompt to add that makes it any better at these Boolean expressions. In fact, for most of these, for a lot, some of these, yes. So hyper baton, logical deduction of seven objects. These are all different benchmarks it's inside big benchmark hard. So you can see for some of these, yeah, you can definitely run this optimization process and the language model that is optimizing gives you the better answer or gives you the better uh, little prompt that you can add and that improves the total accuracy of a different language model. So yeah, here you can actually prompt engineer, but here you cannot. Or I guess this one's just capped because it's 100, but this one here, flat. This one here, also flat. It's kind of interesting, which means that some problems you cannot prompt engineer your way to a better solution. What the fuck is the web of lies? Okay. We got 10 minutes left, so I'm going to close this out. Let's go to the top. Let's summarize this. Let's get you guys going. You know, I don't want to waste your guys' times. All right. So today we read a Google DeepMind paper that came out very recently here, 7 of September, uh, called Large Language Models as Optimizers. And in this paper, uh, what they're showing is that a large language model, right, which is a model that has been trained entirely just to predict the next token of text based on a huge amount of web data that you can use this large language model as a generic optimizer, right? So what does that mean? An optimizer is basically just trying to find the optimal value of something with respect to something else. 
So we everybody knows about optimizers in the context of training neural networks where your optimizer is using the uh, loss function and then adjusting the value of little weights of the neural net such that you get a lower loss value, right? And they're doing this with uh, basically these derivative or slope or gradient based techniques where you're kind of like looking at how the uh, curvature of this loss landscape, not curvature, but like the, the slope of this loss landscape and kind of traversing that down, right? So I've shown this kind of a million times before, but Atom Optimizer uh, loss landscape. Yep, this one. Whatever, I'm not going to find it. But there's a nice little GIF that I sometimes show which shows you the kind of path that different optimizers take. But uh, that's not necessarily important. In this paper, what they're showing you is that language models can literally tell you uh, what the next uh, iteration should be in a iterative optimization process. And they actually go and show you that this works for two different simple examples. The two simple examples are very carefully chosen. Uh, one, because they're simple, and then two, because there are uh, different types of optimization problems. So one optimization problem that they choose is linear regression, where you're trying to fit a line to a set of points. And then the other optimization problem that they uh, solve with a language model or not solve is this uh, traveling salesman problem, which is basically uh, a path through a set of nodes in an XY plane. So here is the linear regression where you're trying to find the value of the W and the B, and they show you they compare against GPT-4, GPT-3.5, text bison. Text bison is a uh, Palm 2 model. It's the kind of uh, larger size. I thought that Palm 2 large was text bison, but this paper makes me think that there's a difference between text bison and palm 2 large and then palm 2 large instruction tuned is the instruction tuned version of palm 2 large which means the chatbot version and it's kind of on par it's actually beats gpt4 at this simple continuous uh optimization of linear regression but then once they uh try to solve the traveling traveling salesman problem the llm has a lot uh harder time doing this and i think to me, what this indicates is that the language model is able to solve this type of optimization problem here, this linear one, because it's kind of doing something like this in its head. It's kind of doing a slope-based kind of technique. It's like it can find the pattern, and it's kind of just following this pattern, especially since they're sorting the answers when they give it. So they say, here's the previous W, the previous B, here's the score. Here's the W two steps ago, the B two steps ago, here's the score. So, and they're sorting those, so they're kind of like almost like leading the language model to the ultimate conclusion of here is the global optimal for optima for this optimization problem. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the motivational part, I guess. That's the way they describe it. They 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 show how the language models can solve these two different types of optimization problems as a motivator for what they are really kind of showcasing in this paper, which is how they used a language model to optimize the correct prompt, right? So they prompt, they used a language model to do prompt engineering. And what is prompt engineering? Prompt engineering is whenever you add a little extra bit to the prompt. So let's say you had a question here, such as this question here, which is part of the GSM 8K dataset, which is one of the datasets that they used. Uh, for this paper, what if you added a little sentence here to the end? What if you added a little sentence to the beginning? What if you added a little sentence here to the answer? Would that adding that sentence improve your performance? And it turns out it does, right? And this is prompt engineering is kind of weird in that way where adding something uh, before or after the question or right at the beginning of the answer improves the score. And then they get a language model acting as an optimizer to find the best possible sentence to put in there. And uh, they do this for a bunch of different benchmarks, and one thing that they do note that's a negative here is that it's very sensitive to initial conditions, which means that if you start by saying, here, let's try this one, and then the LLM is largely just going to kind of riff on that, so it'll give you other uh, prompt engineered additions that basically are very similar to that. So let's solve the problem becomes let's think carefully, becomes let's break it down, becomes let's calculate, becomes let's do the math, right? So why this gets a score of 63 and this gets a core a score of 78 nobody knows but 
we don't need to know, right? All we care about is just getting a high score. Uh, and yeah, and then they basically do that. And then they do it for a couple different benchmarks, bunch of different things. And they try to make some conclusions. They try to say that like, okay, well, maybe more text is bad and good text is not good. And But I don't think those conclusions are necessarily fair. I think there's one sentence in here that I'm trying to find, but the sentence that I'm trying to find is basically saying that it's problem specific, it's LLM specific, and it's hyperparameter specific. So the the optimal prompt for your prompt engineering need depends on so many things that I don't think you can try to make any conclusions, right? It's not that longer is better, it's not that shorter is better. It's not that uh, certain tokens are better and certain tokens are worse. It's like, it's it's a black box. But, I don't know. TLDR, uh, if you're just joining the stream, scroll all the way to the bottom of this paper. Uh, find uh, the benchmark that is most similar to what you're interested in doing. So if you're asking your language model about uh, something related to penguins, then uh, add this to your prompt and your language model will give you a better answer. If you're asking your language model something about sports, then add this to your prompt and it'll give you a better answer. And yeah, maybe just read through these and level up your prompt engineering game. But other than that, pretty cool paper. And kind of just showing you that Nothing is safe. Even prompt engineering will be done better by language models. And I think the cooler version of this paper, which might come out next year, is when someone actually uses a language model to optimize the values of a neural net directly, like the weights, the parameters of a language model. Rather than just prompt engineering, it's actually literally doing the optimization process, the training process itself. But I don't know. We're just going to end it there, guys. Let's see. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, John. Thank you, Eugene, Ed, Elkiat, Khalil, Ali, Josh. Who else? Eugene, Matthew. That's basically it. Any last questions, chimps? Why exactly does this work? I don't know. TY? TY. All right, guys, we're going to end it there. I got stuff to do. See you guys later.